This lesson deals with linearity properties, and in particular the superposition principle. You can find these notes in the ECE 201 ebook in Chapter 3 starting on page 44. This course deals with the analysis and design of what are called linear circuits. One of our upcoming courses, ECE 302, also deals with analysis and design, but of what are called nonlinear or piecewise linear circuits. So I need to define what exactly is that. Mathematically, a function is said to be linear if it possesses two properties, homogeneity and additivity. Homogeneity means that the output is proportional to the inputs acting alone, and additivity means that the output due to two or more inputs can be found by adding the outputs obtained when each input is acting separately. I'll explain this through a series of examples. In circuit analysis, the homogeneity property is called proportionality, and the additivity property is called superposition. Let me just state the superposition principle, and then I'll try to explain what it means, and then we'll go through a proof. The response is to be a voltage or current from a number of independent sources acting simultaneously is simply the sum of the responses which would be produced by each of the independent sources acting alone with all the other independent sources set equal to zero. That's quite a mouthful. What this means is that if I want to solve for a voltage or a current, I can find that voltage or current due to each source with all the other sources set equal to zero. And I want to do that one source at a time, and then I'm going to add up all the results. Now, why would something like that be true? Well, let's try to set a mesh equations for a circuit, because we just had a lesson on mesh equations. Suppose that we have n meshes, so we'll have an n by n matrix with resistive entries here. This would be on the diagonal, the sum of the resistances in the ith mesh, and then the off diagonal terms would be the negation of the resistances that are common between two meshes. The left hand side of the equation would be the sum of the drops of the independent sources in a counterclockwise direction. And then lastly, we'd have a vector here of our unknown uh, n mesh currents. Suppose that we solve for I1. Since we can pick anything and call it I1, it could then be any variable that we're interested in. Using Kramer's rule, we could take the left-hand side of the equation then and put it into column 1. Now let's expand on column 1. So what we're going to get then is the summation of the voltage drops in a counterclockwise direction in mesh 1 times this determinant. The entries that are in here are only the resistances in our circuit. Divide that by the determinant of our mesh equations. Go to row 2, column 1, and multiply this times the determinant with this row. And actually this column deleted, so that what's left over would be this. Again, we'd be dividing that by the determinant of the mesh equations. I'm going to repeat that as we go down the column. Suppose that there are J voltage sources in my circuit. In other words, I'll label them as V sub S1 through V sub SJ. Now they're going to show up in different meshes, and they'll be showing up in these summations as individual voltage sources summed or subtracted. The determinant here contains no voltage sources, and neither does this one. So I'm going to multiply each voltage source that's in this summation by a ratio of two determinants. Those determinants do not have any voltage sources in them. So if V sub S1 shows up in this summation and shows up in this summation, then I'm going to be adding together a ratio of determinants times that V sub S1. And that's true for V sub S2 all the way through V sub SJ. Total response, I1, and once I know a mesh current, I can find any voltage or any current in my circuit, is found by adding up all these terms where I have each voltage source multiplied by a scalar. If I were to set all of these equal to zero but one, I can then find the term K1. And if I set all of them equal to zero except V sub S2, then I could find K2, and so on down the line. And that's our property of superposition. Suppose that we had current sources. Well, then we would have to write a series of Kirchhoff's current law equations to go with our Kirchhoff's voltage law equations. If we had a super mesh, or if we had a current source in an outer mesh, we have a row with plus or minus ones and zeros in it. The left-hand side of the equation would just be the current source that's in that mesh or between two meshes. We have sort of the same situation where our sources are on the left-hand side of the equation. And so again, if we find the value of I1, we would have a series of terms that would multiply our voltage sources, but now we'd also have a series of terms that are, again, ratios of determinants times our current sources. But our technique would then be the same. If we set all the voltage sources equal to zero and all the current sources except this one, then we could find this particular term, K sub L, and we could proceed to the next one and the next one. We could do a similar argument if we started with node equations. 
And that's the proof for superposition. Now in this property, we talked about setting voltage sources and current sources equal to zero. So let's review how we're gonna do that. Setting a voltage source equal to zero is their definition of a short circuit. The voltage is zero and the current is arbitrary or unspecified. Setting a current source equal to zero is our definition of an open circuit where the current is zero and the voltage across the terminals of the open circuit is unspecified or arbitrary. These are some of the properties of linear circuits and in particular, the superposition principle.